It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 312 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 30th of September 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by clinical research nurse doing a Masters of Bioethics, Jo Benamu. Hi Ed. And making her debut on Science on Top, astronomy lover, science communicator and physics student, Kirsten Banks. Welcome. Hello. But before we get underway with the show, just a few little announcements I have to make. Time is running out to get your tickets to the Astronomy Revolution, our evening with the brilliant Dr. Pamela Gay. That's on Wednesday the 10th of October in Melbourne. It'll be a talk about novel technologies revolutionising astronomy. After that will be your chance to ask that burning astronomy question you've always wanted to get an answer to. And then she'll join us on the panel for a live recording of Science on Top. Tickets are $20 each, and all proceeds go to the non-profit Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So that's Wednesday, October 10th at 7pm in Melbourne. Tickets are at scienceontop.com slash live. And then on Saturday, October 13th and 14th, I'll be in Sydney, Joe will be in Sydney, and Kirsten will be in Sydney, and we'll all be at the Australian Skeptics National Convention. I'm really looking forward to this. It's always a great weekend with terrific speakers, and this year looks to be one of the best yet. Oh, stop it, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Primarily because of you, Kirsten. <laughs> and Dr. Pamela Gay, as well as Dr. Carl, memory expert Dr. Lynn Kelly, psychologist Dr. Susan Blackmore, dozens of other impressive speakers, including Kirsten Banks and Joe Benamu. Joe, I believe you're going to be on a panel, is that right? I am. I'm going to be on a uh, medical panel hosted by Dr. Brad McKay. Uh, and I know uh, Brad's been on the podcast before. Uh, he's on the Committee of Australian Skeptics and many people would know him from the uh, TV show Embarrassing Bodies. So that should be great fun. And yeah, the convention's good. I think going to be fantastic this year. It's two days. It's going to be held in Chatswood in Sydney and uh, tickets are still on sale. So uh, they're available from uh, the Australian Skeptics website, skeptics.com.au and uh, get yourself there. And if you can't make it to, to the uh, convention, we've also got the dinner on the Saturday night. Yeah, which is always a lot of fun. And uh, Kirsten, I believe you're, you're going to be talking about Aboriginal astronomy, is that right? I am indeed, yes. I'll be coming along to talk about one of my greatest loves, Aboriginal astronomy. Because you are a Wiranjari woman, and I think I pronounced that wrongly, but anyway. <laughs> Close-ish, uh, Wiradjuri woman, Wiradjuri. So central New yeah. Wales. Very good. Um, but you didn't know that you were a uh, Wiradjuri woman uh, all the time, did you? You only found that out recently, is that right? Or did I get yes. the story wrong? No, 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 you're completely correct. Only about three years ago when I started working at Sydney Observatory as a tour guide, I only really learnt about a little bit more about my Aboriginal culture. So I always knew that I was Indigenous. Like my dad would always tell me that you're Aboriginal, say it loud, say it proud. But we didn't know a lot of details about that. But it wasn't until I started working at Sydney Observatory and started learning more about the Aboriginal astronomy from there in their programs that I decided to learn more about my background. And so it's been a basically like a water slide ever since that first day. Just jumped down and has completely going, lots of fun along the way. Oh, that that's... must have been an amazing experience to have those journeys simultaneously and be able to learn about your, your family and your history and, and so on. Oh, 100%. And then tied in with like the Western astronomy and astrophysics that I was learning at university. It was so much fun. When it comes to Aboriginal astronomy, what, how is that different to the Western astronomy? I mean, my experience comes mainly from holidays that I've had up in Broome and um, obviously different language groups and uh, different Aboriginal peoples over there. But I think a lot of the, the similarities with all the cultures are around the, the great emu there are a lot of stories about the great emu, and from my country, we call it Gugurman. Right. And Gugurman's position in the night sky lets us know when is the right time to go looking for emu eggs to eat. 
Because it's not the actual stars themselves, uh, which we always look at uh, constellations and asterisms and we make the pictures through the actual bright points. The emu is represented, but they're the dark spots, the gaps between the stars. That's right, yeah, we're looking at the, uh, the dust and the gas within our galaxy that, you know, blocks the light from the stars beyond them and they create these patterns that we see and there's one of the biggest ones, of course, is the emu, but there's also a kangaroo in there. Some people see a crocodile, a stingray, all sorts of animals. I love that. Obviously, all cultures have their own origin tales and uh, ideas of what the stars represent. I love that it's obviously a uniquely Australian thing where we see Australian animals and no other uh, culture is going to have emus and kangaroos in their sky. That's right. Well, I heard recently that um, somewhere, oh, I forget exactly which country it is, but some other cultures see a llama instead of an emu. Ah, okay. Which is really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's whatever you're familiar with in your environment. That's right, yeah. And out of interest, just in terms of the, the different the tribes within Australia, are, are there were there great variances between Aboriginal communities in terms of the, the way they described the, the, the patterns they saw in the stars or were they fairly common between different tribes? The way it's described uh, are all very common because it's an oral culture, so we're passing them on by telling the stories. But in terms of the particular stories and specific stories, it's kind of imagine your back in high school and someone starts a rumour and it travels along through the year group and by the time it gets back to the start point, the rumour has completely changed, mm -hmm. right? So neighbours will have similar stories and commonalities and the further away you go, the less commonalities you'll get. Oh, that's a good analogy. I like that. <laughs> Thank I, think you. It's something we, I think it's something we can all relate to as well. Exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how widespread is Aboriginal astronomy in terms of education and all that? So you've uh, obviously done a lot of astronomy education. Has there been much reference to that in Australian schools or is this a separate thing that isn't widely talked about? It's become more and more available these days. Like take me, for example, I've been asked to come to countless schools just this year to talk about Aboriginal astronomy in their curriculums and in their space units, which is awesome. But going back to when I was in high school and in primary school as well, oh, so long ago, um, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't really learn a lot about it. So I didn't really know much about it back then. I'm glad that it's on the improve and becoming more widespread. Mm, it's great. It's becoming more mainstream as well. Like whenever I ask the question in my talks, like who knows about the emu in the sky, more and more hands are going up each time which is awesome. So are there, are there growing uh, relationships being built between uh, astronomers outside of Australia uh, wanting to learn from, from Aboriginal astronomy as well? Uh, I'm not sure. I couldn't say a definitive answer on that. I'm sorry, but that's a good question to think about. Well, I, as uh, when you were mentioning before about the the fact that there's what was it the uh, the the llama or the alpaca, mm. um, I imagine that um, it would be interesting just to sort of tie together those different um, the way things have been interpreted across different cultures and then building those ideas among uh, astronomers who are carrying out work out sort of not not necessarily in contact with this kind of astronomy. Mm. You yeah, know, definitely, I think. Uh, all sorts of astronomers can benefit from learning from different fields of astronomy and different cultures of astronomy as well. Because like anything with science anyway, we're collaborators. We should all collaborate. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the silo approach never works. That's right. <laughs> I'm also curious uh, about the stories and the songs involved in Aboriginal astronomy. Like, for example, going back to Broome again, where there are fossilised dinosaur footprints that you can see uh, on the beach. And the stories there are that that's where the emu came down to Earth uh, as part of, um, I forget the actual story itself, but they're left by their emu footprints and things. Uh, we've also talked to Dr Lynn Kelly a lot about how Aboriginal song lines are about learning things that are important just for survival and that. So I think you mentioned that the position of the emu uh, refers to when it's a good time to go and find emu eggs to eat and all that. Are there other ways that the stories are part of just general life that needs to be passed on by generations? Yep, there's heaps of stuff out there. Like there's 
particular stars that indicate seasonal change. They tell you when the monsoon season's starting or when it's going to be dry, when it's even going to rain as well. So a really cool thing that, um, you know, when you can see a halo around the moon sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you count the number of stars inside of the halo, to some regions that tells you how many days away rain is going to occur. Oh, wow. And that's there's yeah. probably some actual evidence to that because, of course, of the high-altitude ice crystals that are involved in creating that halo. Exactly. And, like, what time of year it happens as well. Yeah. Oh, that is very cool. What, what about things like the planets? Uh, how, how are they translated into um, folklore? So they were definitely seen as wandering stars. Like you see this throughout all cultures throughout the world, that they were definitely seen as stars but not quite stars because they moved independently of these background stars. And we've actually just released a paper about the role of planets in Aboriginal astronomy you're going to find in the Encyclopedia of Planetary Science, which is pretty exciting for me. Um, but we found that they, they're used in a similar way that the whole night sky is our canvas for our stories. So we use objects in the night sky to help paint the picture of what the story is trying to tell. Very cool. I've just found your paper and I'm waiting for it to download. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, very cool. And so what's the main sort of content going to be about your talk at the convention so i'm going to talk about uh different perspectives of the night sky from western to indigenous looking at the milky way and also a little bit at the end of a few of the exciting things that we found in our research about the planets in aboriginal astronomy go on you can't just tease us with that <laughs> <laughs> well i can tell you that uh, right now i'm actually up at siding spring observatory in uh, mm -hmm. australia's dark sky park and i'll tell you what the Milky Way looks gorgeous from out here. Oh, I'm oh. very jealous. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Although I do have a bit of a confession. Oh. Um, going outside from the room in the lodge that I'm staying in is undoubtedly terrifying because even though I am an astronomer, I'm afraid of the dark. <laughs> it's really embarrassing. <laughs> uh, that is fantastic. Um <laughs> Wow. Siding so, so Spring is the um, observatory that was almost destroyed in the bushfire a few years ago, wasn't it? Yes, almost everything was destroyed. Well, the lodge was destroyed, but so it's now uh, newly refurbished, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. But oh, yeah, the telescope survived, which was good. I, I remember sitting there with bated breath when everyone knew that the, the fires were moving closer and there was the, the fear that it was going to be destroyed and just the elation when it survived. Mm. Mm. Why are you up at Siding Spring at the moment. That's a very good question. Like, felt like looking through a telescope? <laughs> yeah, just felt like rocking up here to join the astronomers working here this evening. No, I've been up here for Starfest. So yesterday, yep, Saturday the 29th of September, the Coonabara Brands Siding Spring Observatory was open to the public for Starfest and I came up for Science in the Pub on Friday night, which was very, very fun with uh, Fred Watson and a few other amazing astronomers. Oh, and fantastic. Yeah, and gave a talk yesterday about Aboriginal astronomy again up here on the hill. Very good. I think, uh, shall we move on and uh, talk about some medical stuff, Joe? Do we want to get boring and just talk about medicine <laughs> stuff? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Twist my arm. <laughs> All science is exciting and interesting. Exactly. This is true. Welcome to the concept behind this show. <laughs> science <laughs> is interesting and exciting. Um, Joe, do you want to talk about the aspirin study? This is a, a really big comprehensive study, I think, that uh, shows that low dosage aspirin, which is what uh, people have been prescribed, particularly older people, just a daily dose of aspirin to help uh, reduce the risk of uh, heart attacks uh, is probably not all that effective uh, for people in generally good health. Is that right? That's right, Ed. I have to say, I actually was really excited when um, this study, the, some of the findings of this study were announced because um, the ASPRI study, as it's known, 
um, has been uh, going since it was opened in 2010, and it's actually the largest clinical trial in Australia. So it's pretty significant. The, uh, I'll tell you more about it. So, so what, the the reason that the Asprey study is so important is that it was designed to fill a gap in the literature related to the role of aspirin um, in healthy individuals over the age of 70. And the reason for this is that it was pretty well established that um, aspirin did have some health benefits in um, people over the age of 50 and 60 um, as a preventative uh, in uh, in reducing the risks from uh, people who had risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as stroke and heart attack and so on. But there was no good evidence for people over the age of 70. Now, a study like this is really, really important because we have an aging population and preventative medicine is very important for uh, ensuring that uh, elderly people are able to maintain their health and well-being and, and are able to continue to live independently and have a good quality of life. So the study was led by Dr. John McNeil, who is the head of the Department of Epidemiology and Preventative Medicine at Monash Uni. It was, as I say, it was the largest study uh, clinical trial run in Australia, and it had a sample size of 19,000 people. Uh, it was also run in the US, but 87% of the participants were Australians. And it looked at uh, Caucasians over the age of 70 and Black and Hispanic participants over the age of 65. Um, now, the reason that Black and Hispanic participants were younger is that there's actually a high risk of dementia and cardiovascular disease in those populations at a younger age, and that's why those groups were recruited at a younger age. The, the study was um, a blinded, placebo-controlled study. So patients were given a daily dose of low-dose aspirin, which is 100, in, in this case, they were given 100 milligrams, and uh, they took the, the tablets for a median of 4.7 years. Now, why is aspirin of interest here? So, um, we've known uh, for decades now that, that aspirin prevents platelet aggregation. So, it stops platelets in the blood from sticking together and blocking blood vessels. And the hypothesis was, was that if aspirin works in people who have previously had a heart attack or a stroke, then it should potentially have a preventative effect in those who've never had one before by thinning the blood. Yep. which seems like a pretty reasonable hypothesis. Yeah. So the expected outcomes for the study were that it, it would, if, if the hypothesis was proven, was that the, um, the aspirin group um, would demonstrate lower uh, incidence of uh, heart attack and stroke. They actually found that in the aspirin group, there was no decreased risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, or disability. But what they did find was that patients taking aspirin had an increased risk of bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract, the brain, and other areas. And these were patients who actually required hospital admission and blood transfusion. Whoa. And this was 3.8% in the aspirin group versus 2.7% in the placebo group, which overall doesn't sound like a lot. But when you look at numbers of patients, we're talking about approximately 360 versus 250 people. So that, that, that's 100 more people at risk of, of bleeding, which in this particular group can have quite serious side effects. It's not ideal. No, it is very not, <laughs> very not ideal. One of the interesting findings which they've said which they have said needs further study is that there was actually an increased death rate from cancer in those patients who are taking aspirin. And this was quite surprising. It's interesting. Mm, well, previous studies have shown that, or, or they think that there is an association be between aspirin and decreasing the risk of colon cancer. Now, it's not that there were there was a higher incidence of cancer in, in these patients. It's that people who had an existing cancer, there was an increased death rate. And they really need to, to uh, look at, you know, what, you know, what is the actual physiological reason for this? Um, is this a real effect? And so on. One of the interesting things is that there have also been multiple recent studies that have shown that there is no benefit of taking aspirin in low-risk patients. And ultimately, what this study has, has shown, the overall findings are that, sure, if you have got a history of a heart attack or a stroke, you there is a benefit from taking these drugs because we already know that there is uh, an inhibition of clotting um, and heart attacks and strokes are caused by the presence of clots. But if you don't have any risk factors and you've never had a heart attack or a stroke. This study really shows that if you are over the age of 70 or over the age of 65, if you are um, African-American or or, um, or Hispanic, 
there's no need to start taking aspirin, that in fact, the risk benefit here shows that that there's no reason for you to take this medication unnecessarily. It's very interesting also just in terms of looking at the difference between, you know, population level versus individual um, uh, viewing things from at a population level versus the individual. So we can say that these are the overall findings of this uh, of this clinical trial, but it's very important for individuals to actually talk to their doctors and help doctors work out what the findings mean for them. Mm. So in terms of their individual risk factors um, and in terms of how they may or may not benefit from it. So that is the ASPRI study. Can I ask a really simple question, sorry? Absolutely. What is what is aspirin generally used for? Um, generally, well, look, in the in the past it used to be used for, for pain relief very much, as well as uh, as well as thinning the blood. These days, you know, we, we tend not to use aspirin as analgesia because there are so many other products now that have sort of uh, I think overtaken it as as a as an analgesic. People tend to turn more to paracetamol and ibuprofen. So predominantly aspirin is used uh, to thin the blood, or so as a right. blood thinner. Okay, cool. So it sounds like this is kind of giving more nuance to the debate, which has been raising, I'd say, for decades about whether or not everyone should be having uh, low dosage daily aspirin when they reach That's- old age. That's exactly right. And I, and I think one of the things that you often see with these kinds of studies uh, in so much of, and I think this applies particularly around uh, medical research and health research and so on, is I think the public sadly have started um, switching off from a lot of research findings in, in this space because the way the media present these studies, I think people after a while start to think, well, you know, last week they told us to do this mm-hmm. and now this week they're telling us to do that. Because they, the media don't really help the public to understand that, that science is constantly evolving and that we're constantly refining our knowledge, that there are going to be new messages coming out. And a lot of the time, a, a message about a, you know, a drug like aspirin used to be a very broad message. And a study like this helps us to refine that message so that, you know, we, we can make sure that we're targeting these treatments to the population that will benefit from it the most. Um, you know, even in the area that I work in now in oncology clinical trials, if we look at immunotherapy is, you know, one of the interventions in oncology that we're wildly excited about. And certainly there are some stunning benefits that are being demonstrated in research. But, you know, we're also starting to better understand you know, which patients uh, may or may not benefit from immunotherapy, that that these are not always uh, or rarely are they wonder drugs that everyone will benefit from. And the importance of good research is to be able to refine things down as much as possible so we can ensure that the right patients are actually getting the right treatments and are not being exposed to risk unnecessarily. So what then is the the, the, the final upshot from this study then, uh, people over 70 who haven't had a stroke or heart attack are probably not likely to get any advantage from that's having correct. daily aspirin? So, that's correct. So pa- patients who are not already, patients over the age of 70 who, are, who have never had any uh, previous heart attack or stroke um, and are not currently taking aspirin, should not start taking aspirin. Um, and those patients who have had a, a heart attack and a stroke are not part of this um, study, so the, the findings are not relevant to them. Yeah. Um, and those patients shouldn't stop taking their aspirin on the basis of this study because the, the, the study findings are specifically talking about patients who are healthy and don't have these risk factors. And I want to so, absolutely reinforce don't do anything based on this podcast. Discuss <laughs> no, taking no, or absolutely. not taking things well, the, with the, your doctor. The, the thing is, though, that of course aspirin is an over-the-counter medication. So, but but even even with over-the-counter medications, patient, people should always consult with their doctor because medications can interact with other medications, um, and and people do need to be cautious. I mean, even with something like aspirin, for example, you know, one of the one of the things we always worry about is in patients who are taking aspirin. If they're also taking um, St. John's wort or ginkgo, um, there's an increased risk of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage um, because the these so, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So yeah, that I'm going with my really Latin here: weird. below the spider hemorrhage. Uh, <laughs> 
That's what I was thinking too. <laughs> so if it was spiders and it's I'd, not something I'd remove good. the spider altogether, I think, would be yeah. a better approach. <laughs> <laughs> What's a subarachnoid hemorrhage? <laughs> so essentially, a, a, so a subarachnoid hemorrhage is um, bleeding in the space between the brain and the tissue that covers the brain. Okay. So where most uh, spiders are. <laughs> so where, where spiders live, exactly. <laughs> that, 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 that little funny <laughs> sound. Yeah, that's the spiders. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. I'd stick to astronomy, Kirsten. We're all going to sleep Kirsten. so well <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, so essentially, you know, it's one of those things where um, understanding that um, complementary medicines are not without risk. Uh, and we know that uh, if you're taking aspirin or if you're taking heparin, which is a, another blood thinner, uh, which is given, uh, it, it's um, an injected blood thinner, always want to know if someone is also taking any of these complementary medicines because there have been a good number of cases over the decades of people who have experienced this bleeding, which, which um, is quite a, a, a serious uh, thing to happen hmm. sure well as i said don't make any rash decisions based on this study or this podcast uh, consult with your gp before you add or remove any medications and check that subarachnoid area yeah always <laughs> always check your spiders that's yeah <laughs> all right joe let's finish up with a quick story all about how Puppies are making people sick. And this is <laughs> not the puppies. Oh, it's it's the, puppies. the puppies. I've always Funny said they're bad for it. you. <laughs> this is all about um, antibiotics, isn't it? This is all about antibiotics. And that's actually the reason I wanted to talk about this story because, funnily enough, it's actually something that I've been uh, learning about. Uh, I, I'm in as you mentioned earlier, I'm doing my uh, my master's of bioethics at the moment, and I'm I'm actually studying public health ethics. And uh, one of the the big public health issues of our time is the issue of anti antimicrobial resistance or antibiotic resistance. So essentially, there was an outbreak of a uh, antibiotic uh, resistant disease. And it was traced back to, uh, I think it was Campylobacter jejuni, which is a, a type of diarrheal, a diarrhea type illness. And they traced the outbreak of this disease to, um, I think it was a puppy farm or a, or a pet shop that was selling puppies. And they and these they discovered that these puppies were being given prophylactic antibiotics. Now, this is a very common practice in agriculture. Sorry, in the in the um, farming industry uh, for, for many, many decades, uh, antibiotics were used in, in livestock. Um, and I wasn't aware until I saw this that it's something that apparently is being done in puppies as well. Now, the reason that I was so concerned about this is that probably aside from climate change, which is something that will, of course, increase many of the, uh, the issues around public health that we have to deal with as a, as a society, antibiotic resistance is probably one of, if not the biggest public health issues that we're facing. Um, if we lose the ability to use antibiotics, we will be going back into the dark ages of medicine where a simple cut could end up uh, with someone losing their life because they can end up with a bacterial infection that we're unable to treat. And it could end up putting us in a position in the practice of medicine where simple surgical procedures can't be done because the risk of a person contracting bacterial infection is too high. Now, one of the important issues when we look at things like the use of antibiotics uh, prophylactically in puppies is what we call antibiotic stewardship, and that's the responsible use of antibiotics. And it's about how we as a society decide how best to use antibiotics um, both in humans and in animals. And from an ethical perspective, as well as from a, a scientific perspective, it is an incredibly complex issue because there are so many different factors involved and so many different people involved with different roles to play and th that we can think about in terms of governments and the decisions and, and uh, legislation that governments internationally make about how antibiotics are going to be used, what they can and can't be used for. But aside from that, it's also about how we as individuals use antibiotics. So if we go to the GP and we've got a virus, we've got a cold or, or the flu, and we demand antibiotics from our doctor, our doctor, uh, GPs who themselves 
know that antibiotics will not work for a viral illness are often pressured by patients to prescribe antibiotics because mm -hmm. the patients feel mm -hmm. that they need it. Yeah. So, you know, these are the kinds of issues that we need to think about and we need to talk to our friends and our families and our co-workers about, you know, how we uh, deal with antibiotics. We need to educate people. We need to ask if we're going to go and buy a puppy, um, you know, if, if antibiotics have been used. Mm. Um, we need to think about in terms of, you know, our, our food chains um, and so many of these areas that uh, really I think we all have a responsibility to um, to essentially help change practice. Because isn't it that, because um, from what I always knew, my parents would always be worried if I was prescribed a lot of antibiotics that having too much antibiotics is bad a lot of people worry that have yeah it, it's quite uh it, it is uh, look i've got to be honest i'm not really across the literature on, on that in terms of kids i think they're you know uh and, and i really w would much rather leave that to um you know an infectious diseases expert i think there are fears around things like childhood allergies that you know the that too many antibiotics too much let not enough exposure to dirt and so on that those are sorts of things are sort of fueling childhood allergies and and that um what we call the high hygiene hypothesis, that definitely, you know, from a, a scientific point of view, the, that, that has some weight. You do also just get a lot of fear mongering around the use of antibiotics um, in terms of uh, their potential effects on kids. And some of that, I think, it not doesn't hold up in terms of what the evidence shows. Um, but certainly in terms of um, the one of the common beliefs around antibiotics historically was that it was very important to finish a course of antibiotics. Because yeah, that's what I've always been told. Yeah. Yeah, well, in fact, increasingly uh, that, that, that conventional wisdom is now starting to be rethought that, in fact, once their symptoms disappear, then they should stop taking their antibiotics rather than continue the course until it's finished. Um, I can't remember the, the rationale behind it. Um, I actually read a paper a couple of weeks ago, but I cannot remember what they said the reasoning was, but they are rethinking that conventional wisdom. Um, I guess it must be something similar to like when if you have a headache, you keep having Panadol until your headache's gone. Yes, in that sort of like primary sense. I, th I think I think it's got to do with the fact that you, when you kill the bacteria, it's got to do with the amount of the bacteria that actually uh, left that remain resistant to the antibiotics. But I I, I wouldn't want to speculate because I'll end up making an idiot out of myself because <laughs> I don't know the exact rationale. One right. of the areas, though, which is quite interesting is in um, in developing countries where antibiotics are actually freely available without a script. And so a lot of a lot of the time people are going and just getting antibiotics willy nilly without any restrictions on access. Now, on the one hand, you've also got to we also got to think about the fact that these are countries where access to health care is generally very poor. And, and for, for some of these people, uh, you know, absolutely being able to access antibiotics this way is important. But it also means that they are being misused and and overused to treat bacterial infections which aren't there. You've got to remember, of course, uh, not all bacteria is bad. And That's right. it's an important Absolutely. part of our digestion is having good gut bacteria. So if you're taking oral broad spectrum antibiotics for no good reason, all you're doing is wiping out some of the good bacteria and making it possible for bad bacteria to get a sort of inroads there. Uh, I'm just still unable to get over this uh, chain of pet shops giving antibiotics constantly Puppies. regularly for no reason yeah as well, just absolutely no reason I, I that's what i found very disturbing as well is that i i i find it quite bizarre that given the situation that we're facing this is genuinely a public health emergency but it's an emergency that's happening very very slowly it's not something that we're seeing happen in front of us like an outbreak of you know um of influenza you know global influenza pandemic or ebola it's something that's just sort of very slowly happening and 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 i sort of i, I sit back and i think when are we going to get to a point where we start restricting uh, you know, seriously restricting how these drugs can be used. Mm. Um, one one of the the big problems is that you know we, we may even get to a point where we where we have to. And this is one of the points that um, was made by my uh, lecturer in bio in uh, in this in public health ethics is that you know we're at a point where we're going to have to start making decisions around treating current individuals for the sake of future people who may not exist yet. So the, the ethical argument there is we're going to sort of 
you know, a doctor might have to look at an individual patient and think, well, do I give you antibiotics for your sinus infection or do I give you antibiotics for, you know, is, is your is the pain and discomfort that you're going to experience for, uh, you know, an extra few days or, or a week of illness reasonable given the fact that every time we use these antibiotics, we're potentially restricting the, the future use of these drugs in future populations who may end up facing antibiotic resistance and not having access to them at all. Well, that's the thing too, that people just want to get well fast as fast as they can, whether it's detrimental to them or not. Mm, exactly, exactly. Well, that's a lighter concept to end the show on. That's a- <laughs> Um, well no i think uh, hugely important issues that uh, need to be looked at and uh, uh, very worrying if that practice is ongoing i mean it's worrying that it's ongoing in the farming industry and with cattle and that as well um very very worrying stuff but as i said that's our show as always all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 312 Get your tickets to see Kirsten Banks and Joe Benamou and Dr. Pamela Gay and Dr. Carl and all the other interesting people at the Australian Skeptics National Convention in Sydney on October 13th and 14th at convention.skeptics.com.au and book your tickets to see Dr. Pamela Gay and Lucas and Penny and I for our live show in Melbourne on October 10th at scienceontop.com slash live. And as always, you can go to scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon. Thank you for joining me today, Kirsten and Joe. Thanks for having us. This has been good fun. Yeah, thank you. It's been good to be back. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next time, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Charlotte from Pottsville. Hello, Dr. Got Charlotte. Welcome. Got a question about science. What is it this um, morning? Um, hello. My question is, um, I know I I know about particle physics, but like uh, I know that there's atom as inside a molecule, that there's a nucleus inside an atom, that there's um, protons, neutrons inside a um, inside a nucleus, but and there's quarks inside protons and neutrons. But what would happen if you tried to chop a quark in half? What would you see inside it? Nobody knows at the moment. We think that you are 100% correct. So you've got the atom with a cloud of electrons and at the centre you've got the nucleus. And as you said, the, the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons. And in turn, the protons yes. and neutrons are made of two types of quarks. The proton. There are actually six. Yeah, this, so the, yeah, the, you're dead right. So uh, can you just tell everybody their names? So the uh, ones inside the uh, new, uh, proton and neutron are called the up and the down. And can you tell everybody the names of the other ones? Um. The charm quark, yep. the strange quark, yep. the top quark, and the bottom quark. You're my new best friend oh, forever. Charlotte. So how, how old are you, Charlotte? Eight. Eight. Oh, wow. Now, Charlotte, uh, you should leave your... And, I, and I've already decided that I'm going to be a paediatric surgeon. You're going to give up all your knowledge of particle physics and the Large Hadron Collider and go into uh, paediatric surgery? Well, I have liked... Um, medicine for a lot longer than I have particle physics. I just was reading one of your books and you were talking about strange matter and you were talking about strange quarks and I didn't know what a quark was and I asked my daddy and then from then on I just became best friends with particle physics. Particle physics is weird and the th- weird thing about it is, now I'm going to tell you a, a little secret. You ready for it? Yes. Okay, we have a theory about yes. these particles uh, and it's called the standard model. Now, now here's the dirty little secret. Number okay. one, the standard model is what everybody works with, and number two, it's wrong. Really? We, yeah, yeah, because what we do is we assume in the standard model that neutrinos have got zero mass, and we know that's wrong, but it's the best model we've got now. 